I am here to help everyone understand why it's so important to spend the proper amount of time on character development. And, you know, I, I come from this place of <clears throat> looking at the development of a project, whether it's TV or features or a novel or anything, um, from four different levels. And I've mentioned this in many webinars. If you are all regulars, you've heard me speak to this. Um, but uh, kind of taking a top-down approach, looking at concept, then character development, then structure, then the page work. Page work meaning actually getting down and writing the scene, scene headings, scene direction, dialogue. That's the fun part. What I'm hoping to be able to do is help people see that the development prior to the pages is fun. <laughs> it can also be fun. We need to spend more time in those levels, those three levels of concept, character, structure, um, a lot more time than we do in the pages. And we, most writers tend to flip, right? They spend most time in the pages and they don't spend enough time on the other three levels. And usually you get a draft that just isn't as developed. It could still be good, but you know what our goal as writers should be <clears throat> is to find the best version of your story as quickly as you can. Because uh, if, you, you know, if you take a professional approach to this, the, the pros, the people who are paid to do what we all are loving to, uh, you know, to do, um, are able to just snap these things out quickly. And that's why they're paid so well, especially when they get some kind of a rewrite assignment. Um, they're able to see everything, all four of those levels, kind of all at once. And so in a way, we're, yes, dividing up those four levels of concept, character, structure, page work to organize ourselves, but it's also to educate ourselves so that we can see how they're all connected. So that's the big one, right? It's to, to note that everything is connected. Yes, you can try to brainstorm and develop in that organized way. Concept first, then character, then structure. We all know <clears throat> as storytellers that they're all connected and there's no way to develop the concept without looking at character, without look, considering where things might happen structurally. Uh, I also wanna note that I have individual writing groups that I host and I guess you could say teach. Um, I haven't made it public. I started it in January with a very select small group of people, um, and I am expanding those groups. So I'm, I am looking to bring in more writers, not a ton, um, but if you're interested in these writing groups, it's only $50 a month. Uh, we meet three times a month on Zoom on either th Thursday evening or Friday morning. It's a light workshop. There isn't a ton of feedback, um, but it's just kind of an accountability situation. Lyle is in our group and he's saying it's definitely worth it. Um, the cool thing is, is that the, the groups are really quickly and swiftly becoming friends and colleagues. And I think in this world right now of just, you know, these virtual panels and events, um, it's important to get involved in writing groups. And uh, so I lead them. Um, we talk about news of the week and we kind of ask everybody, what are you working on? Any hurdles? And I ask, answer a whole bunch of questions. It's a very personal approach to things. How do I sign up to the writing group? So I don't have like an active web page where you just sign up. You can email me at workisa.org um, or max at thestoryfarm.org. It's technically through my Story Farm Consulting, but um, we're opening it up to, you know, a lot more people. You can email me there. Just ask me, how do I, you know, become included in the writing groups? Um, and I can give you uh, information. So the, the name of the writing group is just the Story Farm Writing and Accountability Group. Pretty informal. I, I'm doing that on purpose. You know, I just want it to be a fun conversation among writers. Um, and thank you, Molly. You can go to thestoryfarm.org to find out more about my consulting. But um, I'm taking on less and, and fewer one-on-one -on -one clients going forward, kind of going to be focusing on these writing groups. And eventually, we're going to have a really cool expansion to the ISA Connect membership. I'm not going to give all the details now, but coming to maybe two or three months, you should all be aware of what we have going on on the ISA side of things because the website has really taken off. Um, things are growing and uh, it's pretty exciting to be a part of, of uh, the ISA family here. Um, also, I'm just going to add this. <laughs> I don't want to take too much time here, um, but I have a retreat that I am putting on in September. Um, fully aware that, you know, travel and getting together with people right now may seem a little spooky. There's no reason that you need to do a retreat right now. However, if you're comfortable, if you've been vaccinated, uh, if you feel by September that you would like to be a part of the retreat, you can also email me at the same email address um, and ask me about the retreat. And I can give you all the details. Um, it's going to take place in Wisconsin at this huge, I think it's like a nine bedroom farmhouse, uh, real private property near a lake. And 
Um, it's going to be really intensive, very workshop oriented, lecture oriented, but there's going to be a lot of time to get your writing in, which a lot of retreats, ironically, don't tend to do that. <laughs> so anyway, I've been wanting to do a retreat for a long time. We've got uh, a few people already signed up and I'm looking for a little bit more. Where in Wisconsin, Marjorie's asking, um, it's in the southeastern part. So it's right on Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which is about an hour and 20 north of, um, of Chicago, a little less than an hour south of Milwaukee. Pretty easy to get to in terms of airports, but um, I don't want to go into it too much. I want to get into character development. But if you have questions about the writing groups, if you have questions about the retreat, you can email me, max at networkisa.org. This will be posted on pro tips within a week. And, you know, on that note, boy, we have so many videos up, not only in our pro tips section on the website, which you should use, um, but also on our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, you should. It's free. You get little notifications about when new videos are posted. I think we now have over 900 videos on there. Um, it's a free education. And you all are you know, tuning in right now to this webinar because you want to be educated, which you know, bravo to you. Uh, my title is the uh, director of education. <laughs> so I'm going to be pushing that. But there are a bunch of free ways to educate yourself and just stay you know, tuned in. Um, what, you know, why did I just find out about the videos posted? I know, right, Francesca? So I, I apologize. But here we are, you know, we're letting you know. And thank you, Mary, my podcasts are phenomenal. That's very nice. Um, okay, let's get into character development. So <clears throat> I have a, a, a course called The Craft Course. You can find out at thecraftcourse.com. But a lot of what I'll put into the, uh, the share screen mode um, is from the course. Um, but what I wanna start out with first and foremost is this idea of flaw and yeah, maybe I won't here. I mean, well, I kind of wanted to just, you know, do a little bit of a wing it here and talk about character development, but I do have a whole bunch of notes. So flaw is important, it, it, obviously, right? We've all heard the word. I'm always a little hesitant to use the word specifically because there's a natural reaction to the word itself as it, in other words, meaning something negative. And generally speaking, sure, if someone is flawed, it is technically a bad thing, but we don't have to look at flaw as something that is evil or wholly terrible or, um, you know, affecting people in these really terrible ways. Sometimes they do, but we want to look at flaw in a different way, not only in a theoretical way, which I'll get into, but in a very literal help you brainstorm and develop way. Okay, so these are in some ways pretty general questions, just help you get your, your brain going um, to, you know, the creative juices of where your characters are concerned. And I'm splitting them up, obviously. Main character, secondary helper, the rival opponent, villain. Main character, pretty straightforward. The secondary character, that's just the title I give it. Some uh, uh, consultants like Michael Haig call it the reflection character. Um, it's your second lead, right? It's the person that's going on this adventure with your main character. The rival opponent, villain, the reason I'm splitting it up into three titles is because not every character is a pure villain. Not every character is a rival. More often than not, you can just think of it as an opponent because this character is getting in the way in some way of what the main character wants, is attempting to achieve. And really the three are kind of genre based. When you think villain, it's like Ursula from The Little Mermaid. Um, it's of course the character's name that I can't remember um, uh, from Die Hard. <laughs> I can't remember his name. Um, it's a villainous, you know, um, type. Someone who is has larger than than um, life intentions and motivations. You know, world domination, that kind of thing. A rival is, in a very literal sense, the definition of the word rival. An opponent, we can just think of it in general as an opponent. So, these are questions that we can be asking ourselves. Some of them really basic. Who is he or she? You know, what's just life backstory, where they came from, general specs, name. You know, basic stuff. Then you really start getting into the nitty gritty here. What do they want? That's obvious. We wanna know what this person wants, but we're gonna jump down from this one down to here. We wanna consider the difference between what they want versus what they don't know they need. Ultimately, that's the whole point of just about every story in general. I mean, I'm generalizing, um, but a character sets off on some level of a pursuit towards something thinking they want this. But the whole process of the second act and story 
um, is that they find that they actually needed something else, something different, either more important or just completely different. Um, and, and it kind of goes along the lines in TV. It's different in TV if you have a procedural or if you have a sitcom or a half hour comedy, um, you know, the, the, who the character is, what their flaws and traits are and personality and types and all that stuff. That pretty much stays the same. And that's why we're tuning in. We're tuning in to see this person this type of person experience all these different situations. In a serialized hour long, this difference between want and need gets stretched out over either a full season or three seasons, four seasons, you know, Breaking Bad, we quite literally see him perform the title. He's Breaking Bad. <laughs> he's, to, he's going from one type to another. There's a slow evolution there. He thinks he wants something. He finds that he actually needs something else. And, you know, he flip flops quite a bit if you've seen the series. Anyway, good questions to ask. What are they afraid of? That's usually the basis and foundation of a flaw. The deeper reason, you know, a flaw is not that someone is an alcoholic, for example. There's a reason that person's an alcoholic. There's a deeper seated issue going on, an emotional issue, usually steeped in fear in some way. And I think this is an important one, too. What are their positive traits? Because, and I go into this when I really dive into flaw, but... Not like I was saying in the beginning, not every flaw has to be horrible. You know, there, there is a reason the character is who they are now, meaning when we first see them at the entrance of the story. They're, you know, unless you do have someone who is completely down and out, they're at least surviving. And so there are probably positive traits within this character in some way. You know, it's okay to have an unlikable character, that's fine. Um, but, you know, there are positive traits that allow the audience to then relate. And as you probably read, you want to consider the emotional goal and the plot goal. This is a much bigger conversation and lecture, and it kind of digs into the second act a little bit. But uh, emotional goal is what ultimately drives the plot. A plot goal, and here's an example, is find the treasure. The emotional goal is find the treasure in order to prove my worth and save my family name from ridicule. That's the emotional reason he is pursuing the treasure. Obviously, not every story is as simple as that. But anyway, examples of this, you can feel free to take a picture of your phone with your phone. I don't care. <laughs> you know, they're just good ways to help you brainstorm. The secondary character, I'm going to fly through this, everybody, because the, mo the more important elements of character development really are and having to do with um, uh, flaws. We'll get into that. Secondary helper. This character will have flaws and fears too, though it's still your hero's story. We don't want to forget that. Consider how this character supports your main character and how they might bring out the best and worst in the hero. Now that directly then is involved with this next little bullet point. What does the character quite literally do physically to push the main character toward facing their fears and flaws? Again, that's really the whole point of a second act of a feature. And then as I say, sometimes this character doesn't realize she's pushing, pushing or moving, motivating the main character to act that's perfectly normal what i mean by that is a character just is him or herself and because of that personality and type the main character is then reacting and responding um nonetheless the the secondary helper is in place within this story to push this character in some way to put them into situations that the main character didn't necessarily expect to be in all with and in relation to the goal, right? The basic plot goal. And then you want to ask the same questions for this character as you did your main character. Okay, let's just talk briefly about the opponent. Um, I, the most important question is this one. What's your opponent's motive and goal? Now, it sounds so basic, like, of course, I have to figure that out. But more often than not, we find opponents that are just a little weak, and, and we don't necessarily know what it is they want and why. You know, the goal is one thing. Bad guy wants this. What's their motive? Like motive has a different meaning and definition. There's an emotional reason for this character, even if they're a pure villain, to try to achieve something. And then how does this character affect the main character emotionally? This is, you know, in direct relation to the opponent putting the main character into difficult situations, not always just physically, but emotionally challenging situations. What did they do to put the hero in situations? Basically just said that, forced the hero to face up to his or her fears. What's the backstory? It's good to know as much as you can about your opponent that not all of your backstory for the opponent is gonna end up in your story. Um, do they know the hero? Were they once friends? Why are they enemies now? Are they enemies at all? Maybe they're just lovers or you know, attempted relationship partners, whatever they might be, but they have different motivations. When Harry and, you know, when Harry met Sally is a good example. 
they are each other's opponent and secondary character. And I'm sure I've seen, I'm seeing a whole bunch of questions pop up. <laughs> and it's probably in relation to this idea of, I have multiple secondary helpers, I have multiple opponents, you know, this is just a way to try to organize the initial approach of who do I have, you know, who are my players here? And an opponent doesn't have to be someone who is, again, is like an Ursula in Little Mermaid or any obvious, you know, villain. Sally is an opponent to Harry because of her beliefs and, and her personality and what she wants and, and needs. And, you know, just her being her is opposing Harry in a way. She is challenging him. He is technically doing the same to her as well. But that's really the whole process of the story, right? We get to see how these two people change because of their relationship. That's ultimately any romantic comedy. <laughs> Um, so anyway, it's okay to have multiple secondary characters. You still want to do the work um, just like you have, I have listed here in terms of asking these questions of who these people are. Um, and all of these questions for the opponent, it's really to allow some amount of empathy from the audience. It doesn't have to be sincere, like, oh my gosh, I feel so bad for this person. Sometimes that's okay. But we want to know why this character is doing what he or she is doing. What's the reason for this? Other than just, I need to you know, escape New York or, or, you know, I need to take over the world or, you know, it's fine. That is a clear goal, but we need to understand why. Margaret, these are not available for download just because they're specific to the coursework. If you are looking for um, coursework that you have access to all the time, um, it's $99 for the craftcourse.com. Um, and, uh, we're, I'm always updating it and expanding it. And there's a whole bunch of videos and, and podcasts and things on there too. But um, obviously the coursework is going to go into a lot more detail. Um, but anyway, let me look at some questions before I get into some other spots here. Um, let's see. Is the secondary character the antagonist since they force the protagonist to change? Really good question, Melissa. Um, here's the thing. A secondary character can be antagonizing but they're not technically the opponent. And I think word choice is important here because there are multiple characters who can be an antagonist in the main character's life. Um, and they should be, right? Because the whole point is for us to see in a movie, the character to go through some form of an evolution. So it's fine to have multiple secondary characters who are doing this. But the reason why the question so, is so, so good is because there's a very fine line between the difference between a secondary and an opponent. They're both technically doing the same things in a general sense. They're both putting this main character into situations to um, that then force the main character to change, to keep going, to, you know, to face obstacles. The opponent is doing it in order to stop the main character. The, and there are caveats to that. <laughs> but, and then the secondary character is doing it in order to support the main character. Some movies, like I've been saying, some are clear cut. You've got a second, you've got Samwise in Lord of the Rings and, you know, Sauron, who's this horrible, terrible, you know, horrifying eye and he wants to take over. You know, that, those are obvious. Some movies are much more subtle, like a, most romantic comedies are that way. Um, you know, in the very general sense, if a man wants a woman, the woman doesn't want the man. Now we see the woman doesn't want what the main character wants. So the woman is going to try to stop him from doing that. I mean, again, I am hugely generalizing here. Um, but it, it, this is why it's difficult, you know, in terms of the just the craft of screenwriting, because every story is relative. Um, so to answer your question in a very general sense, Melissa, yeah, the antagonist can be the secondary character, but it isn't in the form of a direct opponent necessarily. They can bounce back and forth like Sally does. She's at times the opponent and at times the secondary. Um, let's see, Leslie is asking a very specific question. How important is character development in Hitchcock-like Hitchcock suspense genre material? Um, I'm a fan of this ordinary man in extraordinary circumstances. Uh, none of his characters are particularly memorable, except maybe the killer and psycho. I've always felt that rich character development actually undermines the process of building suspense. A character who is really interesting can ruin an intricate plot. You know, it's it, interesting points, Leslie. I don't entirely agree with everything you're saying. It does not mean that I'm right, because you're right in a lot of ways here that a lot of times the situation itself is more interesting than 
the character, which is fine. However, the situation technically makes this ordinary character more interesting because we get to see, we as an audience get to see how we might react within that extraordinary situation. So that is an, an interesting point to make from, and maybe it's not just Hitchcock-like uh, projects, but just suspense thrillers in general. One of the reasons it is thrilling is because we have a character that's a, you know, we can sympathize or at least relate to, experience something wild. <laughs> so yes, the situation is more important, but we still need to know who that character is. We still need to do the development on who that person is so that we know how that character is going to react and respond in any situation we put them in, whether it's this overall situation of your story or the individual moments that occur within the overall situation. So you have to be able to spend the time to figure out who is this person, what's you know bothering them, what do they want? You know, so a lot of those questions are still absolutely necessary. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Any tips on determining who the real hero is in a story, developing a story where I can see any of the three main characters being the hero? Oh boy, big question. Um, a good question. Tips on determining who the real hero is. You know, the initial, my initial kind of sarcastic response is pick one. And I hate to be lazy with that answer, <laughs> but it's, it's looking at a lot of things from a bird's eye view. Audience experience. Here's an example. In an ensemble project, let's say there are three teenagers on a road trip. All three of those characters are going to be going through um, experiences that change them. You know, it's kind of the whole point of a road trip. They are different when they're done with the trip. <laughs> so all three of those characters, you could argue, well, it's an ensemble. All three characters change and they're all important and they all, you know, make big decisions that then affect the story. But in order to really anchor the audience, even in an ensemble, there is usually one character that's a little bit more prominent, someone with a little bit more to learn than the other two even if it's just a small amount. So I think the, the best answer to that, uh, Geneva, would be to just pick one character who uh, embodies the, the primary theme and message you're trying to get across. Why, what do I want audiences to feel when they watch this movie or experience this story? Um, that one character is going to be presenting that a little bit more than the other ones. Um, let's see. What comes first, story or character? Whew, really good question. I usually come up with a story idea or conceit first. Conceit, for everyone who doesn't necessarily know what that word means in a story sense, it's whatever is the most unique element of your story. Um, however, there are multiple different conceits. There's like a, a story conceit, there's a character conceit. Shrek is a good example of a character conceit. Um, there are cinematic conceits, like what Matrix did with all the new cameras that's usually technologically involved. Um, anyway. I usually come up with a story idea I can see first, then have a uh, then have to plug a character into the story, which then doesn't make the story and plus character organic. Um, that you know, Chris, you're not too, a lot of uh, writers go that route, but it really kind of depends on the idea. Some people are just naturally um, a little more inclined to go to wild big situation. Let's put a character in there. But we what we need to do is put the right kind of character within that situation so that they both are unique and interesting. Kind of like what I was saying, you know, extraordinary situation involving an ordinary character, that character naturally becomes a little more extraordinary, not necessarily incredibly unique. You know, Shrek is the type of character we've never seen before. We've never seen this ogre who just wants to be left alone and, you know, all of his personality traits. We've never really seen that character before, um, which not every single story needs that. Um, it needs something that's different and unique, but a lot of times when you combine character with this big story, then you find the uniqueness. So then it's like, how do you argue what's really the, tr the true uniqueness here? Um, I do want to get into flaws here, but let's just see. Um, how to introduce an ensemble cast in a one hour pilot without it being too much. <laughs> Mateo, I know what Mateo is referencing there. Um, Moments and visuals, I think, would be the best way for me to answer that for now, because it's a big question. But um, we have to remember, in general, you know, whether we're talking about character development or anything, 
what we're really talking about is screen writing. We're writing for the screen. You know, nobody says, what do you want to listen to tonight? You know, we say, what do we want to watch? We're going to sit down as an audience and watch something. So we want to see the visuals on screen. Those visuals need to show us and tell us things as opposed to just relying on all this dialogue to tell us stuff. Dialogue is of course important, but you wanna come, especially when you have a lot of characters to introduce, you have to come up with moments that are gonna be relying on the visuals more than just the dialogue. And it's probably gonna be geared more toward character and personality and trait and type setup. Who is this person? Who are we dealing with? Um, what's the stage of life they're in? Were they just fired? Are they gonna have their 16th birthday? Did their um, husband just leave her, you know, or whatever it is? Um, how do we combine that a little bit so you get a situational presentation from a plot level, but it's really more about the character. Like if you look at Legally Blonde, <clears throat> that movie, I don't know if it literally opens on this, but one of the first moments we see is um, Reese Witherspoon's character um, getting dumped. Her boyfriend's breaking up with her. That in and of itself is like, okay, that's a stage of life. But how she reacts to it, which is not well, <laughs> tells us a lot about her, right? We get to see who we're dealing with within one moment, maybe two. We know exactly who this person is almost immediately. Um, we all, Not just by way of how she reacts to the moment of a boyfriend breaking up with her, but how, what she's wearing, um, the style of speech, what she says. Um, you know, there are so many things that in terms of information that is involved in just one moment. And that's why the next little set of uh, my lecture here is so important. Um, so that would be the, the quickest way to answer your question, Mateo. Um, let's see, what method do you use? Joe is asking, what method do you use to make your main character more fully formed? A history or backstory? How do you uh, devise dialogue that is genuine and unique for that character? So, okay. Um, most of the lectures kind of talking about that, Joe, but um, what method is really, for me, it's list making. It's just making lists. Yes, I want to go into history and backstory, but I cannot spend too much time on that. I don't care how big the story. I, I have a, a, a fantasy, you know, young adult fantasy project that I wrote as a book. I'm now trying to get out as a, a TV series. Um, and that has a huge backstory because it's a ridiculous, you know, fantasy world that I'm creating. Um, and I do have a ton of material written about the backstory of not only the character, but the world she lived in, all of her side characters and, you know, past kings and rule. I mean, but that doesn't necessarily inform the story I'm trying to tell. So we don't want to spend too much time on that backstory as if it's so essential. It's important and it's important for us to know, like J.K. Rowling has boxes full of character backstories, most of which didn't end up in um, the, the books. But what they did was inform character choice and choices, like how those characters are gonna react, all based on who they have been and who they were and who they are now. So yeah, that does help, but we have to be coming from that place of how does this help me right now? How does this help me in my development process for this story I'm trying to write? That's the most essential question. Now, that's a good little um, segue. The problem with what we've been taught about flaw is that it's this like fatal and negative thing. Like it's bad all the time. But if you look at it from the character's point of view, they've been living and in a lot of ways succeeding while living within this flaw, right? So it's technically not bad and negative all the time. The flaw works for him or her. And that is what we, the audience need to be able to see. You know, there's a sweet and a sour uh, take to every flaw. It allows the character to achieve currently, but overall, really what it's doing is holding that character back from being the best version of themselves. And that's why a story, you know, doesn't need a full 180 degree change or arc in your character all the time. You know, Marlon in Finding Nemo goes from one piece, you know, type of character to really the 100 degree 180 degree difference in the end you know that's pretty normal in pixar and family animated movies they're very different in the end and that's just the process of that genre and style but like steve carell and 40 year old virgin he's kind and selfless but to a fault so being kind and selfless is a good thing that's not a flaw but if it's to a fault it means he's not considering himself right 
So, you know, then looking at this idea of 180 degree change, do we want him to be ruthless and selfish in the end? No, but we, we have to go deeper in our brainstorming into why he's so kind and selfless to a fault. You know, so you could argue that he is this way because he's afraid of being vulnerable and showing people who he truly is because he might feel like he's discovered because he's self-conscious and he thinks he needs to be a certain type in order to get others approval. Those are the reasons why he is kind and selfless to a fault. So his evolution is to find that he can be himself and still be happy, right? It really has nothing to do with being a literal virgin. That's why I love that movie so much. Yes, it's in the title. Yes, we see him going on these you know, horribly uncomfortable dates and experiences. And he's constantly presented with this, this you know, idea that he's, he's gonna you know, never have sex with anybody. But, and there's a great line where he's in this like group. I can't remember, it's like a therapy group or something. And he asks in this really meaningful way, um, is it true that if you don't use it, you'll lose it? <laughs> but what I what I love about that line is that he's so genuine, like he's really concerned, like that might actually happen. And so we get to see through moments in terms of who that character is. Um, well, I'll, I'll restate that. We see in small moments who that character is. And so little moments like that, one line of dialogue defines who that person is, right? I mean, we get to see and, and learn so much information from just one moment. Um, and now going into the next paragraph, which you've probably already read, <laughs> most important element of the character flaw, we have to be able to see scenes and moments that could be in your story as soon as your brainstorming begins, or at least as quickly as possible. This is really the whole point of my um, lecture today. And it's something that when I it wasn't like an aha moment or an epiphany for, for me when I, in my process of learning how to write screenplays. But when I understood what that means, boy, it not only did it speed up the process, but it allowed me to get to the heart of what I was trying to do and say and all of this, because what the flaw does is it creates potential moments and scenes. So you want to allow your flaw brainstorming to be an opportunity to develop at the scene and moment level. So you make lists of those possible scenes based on your character's flaws. It's gonna change your development process for the better. It's gonna speed it up. You're gonna start seeing moments and scenes and lines of dialogue. More importantly, it allows you to write in a non-linear way, right? Because in, like I was saying in the beginning of all this, that I kind of organized the development process from concept to character to structure to page work. What we're doing is bouncing from character down to page work. So it's not like you can't write any scenes at the outset of your um, brainstorming. What you shouldn't do is continue going. Like you write a scene and you go, I'm just gonna keep flowing. I'm really feeling it. That's when you're gonna just get stuck or you're gonna write bad scenes and you're gonna feel bad about yourself and you're not gonna write the script for another eight months. <laughs> and I'm speaking from experience here. So you're bouncing from just conceptual character brainstorming. What are the flaws? Who are these people? And then go to, well, if it's this flaw, what would that look like? Literally, I mean that in a very literal sense, what does it look like? What is a moment that is going to show that? What's a line of dialogue that's gonna show this person's flaw? And here are some examples. These are just really general and you can probably get even deeper. These are just basic service level things that you can read here. But all of these flaws, like you pick one, tries too hard to be liked. Okay, what does that look like? You wanna ask that question after every single one of these. This can be at the top of a document, right? You could put, it tries to, too hard to be looked, uh, to be, tries too hard to be liked. You put that at the top of a Word document, you just make lists. Here's a moment, here's a moment, here's a scene, here's a line of dialogue, here's a situation they can be in. Who cares where it exists in the story? Who cares if it even is any good? Who cares if it ever ends up in the, the script? This allows you to start seeing things. And that's, you know, like I said before, we're working in a visual medium here. We have to show these moments, scene direction, scene headings, formatting, transitions, and, you know, parentheticals, and none of it matters at the outset of the development of your story. It just does not matter. Eventually, it's extremely important. <laughs> but when you're trying to figure these things out, you're just looking for moments. What are these great moments that are going to define what I'm trying to do here? What's the DNA of my project? You know, that the primary theme, the message, what am I trying to say? Like somebody was mentioning the conceit, you know, what I have to be sticking to that conceit. I have to be delivering on the, pr the promise of the premise that I have, this big story, 
Let's get a character in here with some flaws and specific issues that they're dealing with that are then going to provide moments that I could just end the lecture there. And I'm sounding, well, I'm sounding cocky, <laughs> but, but it, it really is that simple, but also you've got a mountain of work ahead of you. But like Mary was saying, it's fun. Just coming up with moments and ideas of, of scenes and lines of dialogue to help you define not only who the character is, but what your second act is gonna look like. Because we see Finding Nemo, Marlin, he's overprotective. Thor is arrogant. In Up, Carl is cynical. Ebenezer Scrooge puts money before people. You can look at all of the other examples out there, all the movies that you can think of. Try to define what that character's flaw is and then point out the moments throughout the second act that show us the audience that he or she is this way. And I apologize for only choosing men here. <laughs> um, to, anyway, so I hope that makes sense. You know, what do flaws offer the story? This is from masterclass.com. Um, there are a whole bunch of things that those flaws offer. But again, you wanna be looking at the moment that provides the flaw that then offers these things makes the character relatable, presents an obstacle to overcome. Green, these are really basic things. Um, but it's about the moment that shows us the flaw that then provides these elements. Yeah, I like how we're using psychology when writing. Look, absolutely, Natalie says, um, there's a huge, there should be a huge emphasis on our own search for this. So in other words, we are all flawed also. We have issues going on. We haven't gotten over things. We're living with them. We're probably doing okay, but there we have flaws. We can get over them, but we can also go back in our past and look at some moments where we saw, and it's probably some of the embarrassing moments in our lives, <laughs> where we saw our flaws come out. It's the same exact thing when we're developing story and character. And for us, you know, obviously we know ourselves a little bit better than we know our characters more often than not. And we can dig a little bit deeper and go, why do I have that flaw? What, what, where does it stem from? And then you can start to see ways to fix it a little bit. It's the same exact process in writing a story. TV, like I said, a little bit different. You, want to, you still want to do the flaw work if you're writing a half hour or a network sitcom. I guarantee you that's what the writers on Friends did for all six of those primary characters. Because that then allows them to go, here's an episode idea, here's a storyline idea, here's a character moment idea, because it's all based on who these characters are. Joey is this way, Chandler is this way, Rachel's this. They're all very different. And so those flaws provide opportunity for storylines per episode. And that's why we're tuning in. We're getting to see these people with these flaws, which are fun, sometimes kind of annoying, but they're, you know, it just provides comedy. We're seeing the same character within different situations. In a serialized hour long, we're seeing the same general situation with a character that's slowly evolving through these situations. TV is a whole other monster because there are so many different types of genres and, and you know, length of time and either it's animated or it's an, a procedural, you know, live action. And, and so you really have to define what your show is, um, but you're still doing basically the same character work. Um, let's see. Let's see some questions here. Um, Adam, what is your take on writing characters that are not you? As an example, single white male here writing a show. Uh, it's been optioned. Congratulations. Um, with female single mother as a protagonist and autistic daughter. Obviously, I'm not any of these things, but do work with children on the spectrum and have known several single mothers. So, that answers your question. <laughs> I mean, it's a lazy way of answering your question, but it's incredibly important for us all to be aware of what we don't know so that we can at least try to find ways to inform ourselves. Um, just because you're a white male doesn't necessarily mean you can't write a female character. However, you have to be aware that there, it's a literal impossibility for us as white men to understand what a woman goes through. We might know about it, but we, we don't have that experience. So you, you need to do the research. You need to talk to people, um, ask them very specific questions, um, maybe bring someone on who is in a consulting way to help write some dialogue for you to get that voice out. Um, you know, if you're writing someone from a completely different culture, 
they're going to have not only different beliefs and backgrounds, but they're going to have different inflection and voice. They're going to have different words they use. So those are all important. It's a really good question, Adam. Um, I think the fact that you have that experience with both of these um, types, then great, you know, work with those. But do as much research as you can. Pay attention. I mean, I this fantasy story that I just I mentioned earlier that I wrote um, is about a 16-year-old female, five-inch tall fairy with a disability. I'm literally none of those things. <laughs> but what I did, what I grew up with three older sisters um, who all, you know, this main character shares in the personality of my three sisters in a lot, a lot of ways. Um, I, you know, I'm the youngest of four, so all three sisters were older than me. So I, I had a direct experience of their personality um, and my direct experience in terms of its, it relating to the character is of course, the fact that I have been a teenager um, you know, we all have some level of a disability or something that's holding us back. Obviously, I'm extremely lucky that I don't have a literal physical one. Um, but we can speak to what we believe about them. But we do need to, you know, go the extra mile and, and do the research and find out how might someone react. And, you know, if this is not me. Um, Anne is asking a question about structure. I heard flashbacks are not to be used anymore in Hollywood. Is that true? No, not true. Um, flashbacks can be a little bit of a crutch sometimes. Um, and uh, we don't want to rely on flashbacks to just give us, you know, constant plot information. We want them to be character oriented. Um, we don't want to, we don't want to rely on them. Flashbacks are totally fine to use, but we don't want to overuse them because then it's suddenly like, you know, the audience is wondering, where are we here? Am I now or am I then? What's the story you're telling me? You know, it, it's always best to try to stay as current and in the now as we can. Uh, when doing a research on a character or its development, how do you organize the uh, information to remember all of the traits? Is there a certain order to do research, listing more recent events first, their relationships? Boy, it's a good question, Gloria. And I, honestly, I'll just be frank. I don't know exactly how to answer it because I think it's different for everybody. Um, when doing your research on a character or its development, how do you organize the information? You know, obviously, or I should say, honestly, anything that makes it easier for you. Gosh, it seems like a lazy answer. And I apologize, Gloria, but it's a good question. Um, but really, if you can be organized and be able to see it all, you know, one thing to remember when you're doing research on a real person and you intend to write a story about that person, the better, the better approach, not necessarily, I shouldn't say best, but the better approach is to try to find a moment or series of moments in that person's life that defines the point of the story you're trying to tell. Because if you are to tell, if you have a biopic about someone and they're you know, relatively well-known, or even if they're not very well-known, they have a whole lifespan of experiences. And we really can't get into every experience. Otherwise, you know, if, and if you try, it becomes like I watched the, the recent documentary, um, it was called Lincoln, a uh, country divided or something on CNN. It was really good, but that's a documentary. You go from him as a small boy to him being a Senator and, you know, all the other in Congress. Um, and then, you know, we see the lifespan, but in a movie, you've got two hours, maybe two and a half, but you know, try not to go that route. <laughs> um, so you have to kind of get a slice of life. It's kind of like the Johnny Cash example um, in Walk the Line, those writers chose to focus on Johnny Cash's pursuit toward June and that romantic back and forth and her, you know, telling him no and all that stuff. And we got to learn about Johnny Cash through that kind of slice of life. Um, in a, let's see, horror thriller genre, do you have, do you find having the secondary character die to be a better option to have them live? What's better for the audience in general? Really big question, Deborah. And honestly, I don't think there's a perfect uh, answer for that because it really depends on the story. Um, my personal, well, I don't know if I want to add my personal response there because I love horror thrillers. I hate them when people die in them. <laughs> you know, I want, I, I like the happy endings. I want things to work out. Not every story needs to do that. But, um, you know, do you find having the secondary character die to be a better option than to have them live? It really all depends on how important that character is within that story and what that type of moment of the secondary dying is going to teach the main character. Um, that then, of course, is totally relative to the story, to the story you're writing. Um, let's see, Anonymous, just a quick point about Hitchcock's characters. They may seem not so interesting or deep at first, but 
pour over those scripts and you'll see that all have tremendous backstory. So much has been figured out beforehand. Yeah, yeah edit it out of you know, tight final shooting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's still, even if you have a character that's ordinary and they're just experiencing something that is extraordinary, there are still, there's still a ton of, of development character work. Um, let's see, one, uh, uh, let's see, we've got a question. How can I get access to, uh, to this teaching workshop because I got into the meeting late? So um, this, the recording will be posted on the pro tips section of the ISA Insider page on the ISA website. Um, I believe it's eventually gonna be on the YouTube channel as well. Um, William, how to show characters attitude, emotion, and value in the most efficient way. So through visuals, through moments, don't rely on dialogue. I, I, and with an emphasis on don't rely on it. Of course, you can have dialogue, but one little you know challenge I give my writers when I'm working with them one-on-one -on -one, um, is to consider if you were forced to write your script without any dialogue, could you get the same story across? Try to take that approach, at least just mentally. Uh, first, look at the scene that you wanna write, what is the scene? What's the point of the scene? You know, who wins the scene? Who loses the scene? What's their motivation within the scene? Um, and consider, could I still show all of it by just showing it as opposed to saying things? Then, of course, the dialogue comes into play and it's kind of commentary or it's, you know, it's boosting the moment and, and um, they're not necessarily speaking exactly to what they believe or what they're thinking and kind of talking around it. Um, so yeah, it's all within the moment brainstorming based on what that character's flaw is, kind of like what I was saying before. Uh, do you re recommend writing an accent or assume casting will choose someone by character description? So this is speaking to on the page, the words on the page. Um, sure, right, and you can write toward the accent if it's necessary, if it's gonna help define who that character is. I will say that if it, there's a lot of it and all these characters are speaking in you know certain accents, it can be difficult for the reader to get through it. It just slows it down that much more. Um, so I would try to, you know, be somewhat sparing. If it if it is defining a character that this person speaks a certain way, great, go for it. Um, let's see, is something like The Crown consi considered a documentary? Christine is asking that question. So no, um, a, 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 The Crown is a narrative hour-long drama. And the reason and difference, it's a good question. I haven't really figured out how to answer that prior to this, <laughs> but it's one of those things where you kind of know it when you see it. You know, a documentary um, is interview-based. Um, you have, you know, speaking to the camera, you have, you know, actual footage showing. Um, it, it's not fictionalized. I think that's the biggest difference. Hour-long drama is going to be fictionalized, um, even though it's based on something that actually happened. A documentary is nonfiction. Uh, let's see. Can you have two equally strong, flawed protagonists fighting each other and let the reader choose who their hero is? Hey, you look at any of the Avengers, it's totally, absolutely can. Um, just because they are, I always hesitate to use the word protagonist. I try to emphasize main character um, because it just sets things in our brain a little bit more. Um, but to answer your question in a very simple way, Anna, yes, absolutely. Um, it, now, if we're looking at a, a story where the whole thing is about these two fighting, then you also have to consider that one character is the other's opponent. And so they're, they're kind of two things, you know. Um, let's see, William, if we follow a punch list approach to our character development, how do we avoid ending up with a formula feel, boilerplate vibe, which seemed to be happening in a lot of current shows? Um, it's a good question because it is easy to just write a template and, you know, follow structure perfectly. Um, but the best way is kind of like what we were saying before, you know, an extraordinary situation that we haven't quite seen before with an ordinary character allows for, even if it is templated to keep people on their toes a little bit. So, I, so ironically, William, that's a little bit of a question of concept. Is this something we haven't seen before? Like if you look at a movie like The Purge, really incredibly unique we hadn't really seen that movie before but the structure is the same it's this you know you've got a setup event you've got you know midpoint complication there's a low point you've got a big climax so structure is meant to be used to help you brainstorm those moments but there's also a level of audience expectation that comes into play we should be moving forward in this you know by this point um, otherwise it's going to go too long or it's going to go too short and i don't know the characters well enough um, so really it's all about 
can I make this concept as unique as I can? Um, let's see, Michael, in a buddy story of romance, do you have any tips for the pacing of the characters grappling with their flaws while forging a bond? Whew, big question, Michael. Um, pacing of the characters grappling with their flaws while forging a bond. I mean, my brain keeps going to When Harry Met Sally. It may because, be because I just know the movie so well. But if you look at Harry, he's extremely flawed. And, and he's constantly put into situation that, situations that challenge that flaw. You know, he's, he, he meets Sally. She has very different beliefs than he does. He always thinks he's right. Um, he's a know-it-all. He's kind of a chauvinist, if you want to be honest. Um, but then things happen to him. Um, when, you know, he gets a divorce. And that really levels him out. And suddenly he kind of eases up a little bit. But then anger sort of kind of comes out and takes over. Um, so tips for the pacing, it's, it's not that much different than looking at a, the general structure of a story, but the, 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 in other words, hitting the beats is fine, but you want a continual process of complication. Back to the Future is a great example of that. Almost every single scene has a new twist or complication. That's why it's so fun to watch. It's always a new thing that happens that makes them go in a new direction. You know, Marty arrives in 1955 and he's like, what is happening? He looks at the newspaper, holy shit. And he looks at, you know, uh, the cafe, walks in there and he's just kind of sitting there. Suddenly his dad's sitting next to him. Holy crap. And he's like, what is what? And then Biff walks in and then his dad leaves without Marty being able to say anything. So Marty runs to try to find his dad. And then he finds out his dad's a peeping Tom and he falls, you know, into the street and Marty saves him and Marty gets hit by a car. Then he wakes up in bed thinking it was a dream. And it turns out, nope, still 1955. And his mom has a crush on him literally every single scene is forcing a, a new reaction, a new twist, a new response. And it's keeping all of us on our toes. It's a constant like, oh no, oh God, what's gonna happen now? What's gonna happen now? Now, not every single movie needs that type of pacing. I mean, that's a different type of genre. It's an action adventure. Um, but by taking that approach of looking at not only a flaw-based approach to moment listing, but looking at it structurally, just about every scene or at least sequence a sequence can be you know multiple scenes over maybe an eight nine page pro process they're like little movies that are being told you know we've got a beginning middle and end with a climax a resolution or new new direction boom we go off in that direction these things happen that are complicating oh we got to go in that direction um so you know uh, characters grappling with their flaws it, it is just it's a constant process of flaw confrontation that a character is going through you know, in a second act of a movie. Same with the serialized show. Um, we got a little bit of time. I'll go through some of these here. Um, off topic, but will you be doing any webinars on writing a contained script? So I don't have anything planned specifically for writing a contained script. Um, I, I mean, I was going to go in. I, I can't, I don't have time to go into the lecture now, <laughs> but I will say it's not that much different than the process of a non-contained script. But kind of a lot like what I was just saying, even in a contained thriller where you've got one, maybe two locations, two or three characters, you still need that process of constant complication, constant change. How do you allow for that feeling of constant twists and complications? Sandra's asking what's a contained script, meaning it's very few locations, one, two, three characters. Um, the important point to remember with a contained script is that we really have to understand what it is the character is trying to do and you know and achieve and, and you know what that person's pursuing but then what's at stake the stakes help allow for those continual levels of complications and twists and new directions um and keeping it relatively simple you know if you're trying to get really complicated then it, what are we following um let's see William's asking, is the craft course without any feedback? It is, William. Yeah. So $99, you get the course um, with, you get a whole bunch of video and, and, and written lectures and audio, audio podcasts. There is there is not feedback included. You can purchase feedback through the ISA's development evaluation, um, or you can work with me one-on-one. -on -one. There are plenty of ways to get feedback. Yeah. Uh, Christine, so this is the last question in the list here. Um, with a biopic, fictionalized drama, uh, would each episode need an arc? and the whole thing need an arc. So the very basically answer your question, Christine, yes. Every episode of TV 
and this is, gets really complicated. Everybody writing TV, you have more work to do. <laughs> it's just the truth of it. Thanks, Victor. All good if you have to go. Um, you have more work to do, but that's because you've got multiple storylines that you're tying together, not only just overall in the series conceptually, but then in the one season, you've got an A story arc, beginning, middle and end for the primary main character pursuing some level of a plot goal. Um, but then you also have a little minor, uh, you know, maybe you could say B story character storyline that the characters then, you know, uh, being affected by, you know, the relationship that person's in, you know, they, they have a son or a daughter, or, you know, that's a personal storyline that's going. And then you also have another secondary character that has some level of a B story plot line that's going through the whole season. And then an emotional uh, character storyline that that character is dealing with. Sometimes they're intertwined, the A character, B character. Um, and then sometimes you have a C storyline, you know, all these things. Stranger Things is a great uh, 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 series to break down because they do it so easily. Like it's just, it feels effortless and you can see it all from a structural standpoint. All these different characters with all these different plot goals, all these different emotional issues that they're dealing with. And then it's all combined in the fact that the monster is trying to kill them all, <laughs> you know? But to then go specifically to an episode, you have pretty much the same thing. You have the whole season, you know, being presented through, you know, moments and scenes and storylines that are a part of the overall A story plot, B story plot, et cetera. Um, but it's contained in an episode. And then you have an episode story. And again, it kind of depends on the type of show you're dealing with. If it's a procedural, they either solve the case at the end or they don't. Or there's a medical issue that House is dealing with, and he probably solves the problem in the end, you know. But then along the way, you've got personal storylines that might carry over and are serialized throughout the rest of the show. Um, so yeah, every episode needs some level of an arc. It doesn't necessarily mean that the character needs to be completely changed by the end. They might learn a little bit of a lesson and make, you know, become a little bit better than they were, but they're pretty much going to be the same character. You know, the one little thought that I always give um, my writers is that. For TV, and you know this just because you, you all watch TV, I assume, <laughs> um, we'll see you know, a trailer or a teaser to a show. And we'll probably think either we will watch that or we won't watch that. Let's just say you say, I will watch that. We're watching it, or at least considering, hey, cool, I'll watch that just because of the concept. We're thinking, oh, the situation seems kind of neat. It seems like something I'd be into. I'll watch that. We'll continue watching it because of the characters. Because you already know what the concept is. Every kind, you know, the plot, Game of Thrones, it's the same fucking concept. <laughs> it's dragons and zombies and people trying to kill each other and take the throne. Like with that, every episode's basically about that. But we kept tuning in, for those of you who did, because the characters were just so interesting and the stakes were there. And, and of course, we kept tuning in because of the special effects and just the world. But we really enjoyed watching these character storylines, seeing these people go through just hell and back hating certain characters, loving others who are out here, you know, we're tuning in because of the characters in terms of future episode watching. Like Resident Alien is another good example if you haven't seen that on sci-fi. Um, I tuned in because the situation itself sounded funny, but I also love Alan Tudyk, who's the lead care, uh, actor. Um, I tuned in because I'm like, okay, it's Alan, he's gonna be so funny, and he is. Um, but then I kept watching because the situation they're in, not only from a plot standpoint, but a character standpoint, just kept being fun and intriguing and interesting. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, oh, well, Christine's asking biopic fictionalized drama, and specifically for a biopic, it's the same thing. Yes, absolutely. You know, biopic fictionalized drama, if you watch The Crown, you see those characters go through these problems and arcs and, you know, we tune in because it's about the queen and the royal family, but we keep watching because the characters are interesting. Um, okay, cool. I'm getting nice little comments here. I'm glad everybody's getting a lot out of this. It's, it's a lot to take in. I think if there's anything that you remember and, and, and learn from today's class is that you can use your flaw brainstorming to then create moments and scenes based on that flaw, regardless of where it exists in the story, um, whether or not you're going to use the scene, it really, you kind of jump to the fun part of, okay, they have this flaw. What kind of situation could I put that person into to really allow that flaw to shine? Um, any way to determine if a biopic should be a limited series or a feature film? Oh boy, Paul, it's a big question right at the end. <laughs> um, if you see that the ongoing situation, there's a recurring process to 
the concept and you feel like it's always going to be interesting that we could see this moment occur over and over and over again, moment meaning type of moment, um, then it's the series. If you feel that there's one or two moments in this person's life that's really essential and cool and intriguing and engaging, but you don't really feel like it can continue, like it's going to lose its legs, then it's a movie. It sounds easier said than done. I'm sorry. Maybe I don't mean to sound condescending, <laughs> Paul, but it's a big question. And, and um, it really all has to do with the set, you know, kind of second act recurring moment idea. Um, all right, everybody, that is everything. Um, yeah, pay, pay attention to uh, upcoming events that the ISA has. We got a whole bunch going on, as always. We love seeing you all at the third Thursday's events. It's a way for everybody to kind of get together. Um, and um, we had a really cool event. I think it was last week, Friday, or two weeks, oh boy, where it was a lot of the ISA uh, employees and, and consultants, you know, talking about just craft in general. And that was a really cool um, event. Yeah, Mary saying, bring back wine Wednesdays. We'll see, you know, we're doing so many things as it is. We won't, we don't have any evenings <laughs> to ourselves, uh, much less to write. I will talk to you all soon. Thanks, everybody.